I think that uh, I've been blamed, blamed for everything. I am basically there to, uh, to make money. I cannot and do not look at the social consequences of, of what I do. I am concerned about the society in which I live. Which George Soros am I talking to now? The amoral George Soros or the, the moral George Soros? Uh, it's one person. It's one person who at one time engages in amoral activities and at the rest of the time tries to be moral. College campuses across the U.S. are being fundamentally destroyed before our very eyes. Students on both ends of the conflict were enraged and it seemed chaos was the only answer. Everything and more was on the table at these riots. But how did things flip so quick? What started off as peaceful protesting somehow escalated into a full-blown war zone. And that's because what people didn't know was that there was one man responsible for all of it, George Soros. George Soros is one of the most destructive forces acting in society right now. As protests and chaos rise amid global conflict across the world, George Soros always seems to find himself in the center of a crisis. He's always at the epicenter of political issues, fighting the good fight, and donating to causes to better the world. It's safe to say nobody has done more to stop and put an end to all the violence and destruction than George Soros. After all, he is a philanthropist. In fact, in 2020, Forbes declared Soros the most generous giver, as he donated $32 billion of his wealth, leaving himself with only $6.7 billion of net worth. But the truth is that George Soros is hiding a dark secret, a side of himself that he never wants to be brought to light. And he secretly has a sinister plan that threatens the freedom and lives of so many citizens across the country. But to understand how he got to where he is today, we first need to go to Budapest, Hungary, where Soros' life began. George Soros was born 93 years ago in 1930 in Budapest, Hungary. He was born to a Jewish family of two parents who were wealthy and well-educated. His father was a successful lawyer and well-known author who lived on an island in Danube and liked to commute to work in a rowboat, and his mother ran a store that sold silk in their town. He lived his early childhood years, just as any other child did, as a free-spirited kid who enjoyed having fun with kids his age. It was a good life and his future looked bright as he came from a good family. But that would all change once George turned 14. In 1944, the Nazis had began their genocide of Jews across the world and had also gained control of Budapest where George and his family lived. Soros' life quickly changed in an instant. He no longer could go outside and have fun. He'd spend every night worrying in fear for his life as he watched his loved ones and friends be carried off to be beaten, tortured, poisoned, and murdered within Nazi concentration camps. It was only a matter of time before the Nazis got to him and his family, but his father would not let this happen. He knew that if they stayed in Budapest, it'd only be a matter of time before they were tortured and killed. So his father decided to split up the family to keep everyone safe. He bought them forged papers and identities, and he bribed a government official to take in 14-year-old George Soros and claim that George was his Christian godson. Survival carried a heavy price tag while hundreds of thousands of Hungarian Jews were shipped off to the death camps. But George Soros accompanied his new fake godfather on his appointed rounds confiscating property from the Jews and eventually escaped the massacre in Budapest and eventually headed to England at 17 to start a new life. After witnessing the death and slaughter of many of his friends and loved ones, Soros vowed to change life altogether. He'd do whatever it takes to position himself to never have to experience that oppression again. And from that day, he promised himself inside that he'd never be a victim again. So in his first endeavor, George went off to get an education at the London School of Economics, where he'd learn about the value of money and global economics. While he was a student in school, he worked as a railway porter and a waiter at a restaurant to start saving money for himself. And not shortly after, he graduated from university with a bachelor's and master's of science and philosophy three years after. And with his new educational background, he could now venture into the real world, one where he can make a change and a name for himself. So he left university and entered the world of finance, securing his first job in banking at the Merchant Bank of Singer and Friedlander on London. At the bank, he started off at the bottom, working as a clerk and later moved to the arbitrage department. Inside, Storo studied the ways in which the bank functioned, how they made money, and how they managed relationships with customers. And it lit a fire deep inside him because he knew he could do it too and that his journey was just beginning. From there, he worked inside many banks in England after Singer and Friedlander. And as time progressed over the course of 10 years, he worked for three other large banks in England. He worked for F. M. Mayer, Weatherheim & Co., and Arnold and S. Blakeroder Investment Bank. And while Soros worked at Arnold and Blakeroder, he went on to become their vice president from 1963 to 1973. 
But during his time as vice president there, he had been saving and accumulating company funds to start diving into more aggressive and diverse trading strategies. And he discovered that he was a huge success. He figured out exactly how to be a profitable trader. Which led Soros to start his very first hedge fund, the Double Eagle Hedge Fund. Since he was doing great and continued making positive trades, investors raised $4 million in addition to Soros investing another $250,000 himself. And under Soros' management, the Double Eagle Fund tripled its investment and was now valued at $12 million. Soros was a hero within his firm and a feared trader among the titans of Wall Street. And he took things further and officially started Soros Fund Management in 1970. And just 10 years later, Soros Fund Management had reached $400 million in value. He was doing phenomenal, but although George had built a massive empire, it just wasn't enough for him. He still felt compelled to amass more influence, more control, and more profits. And his next trade would change his frame of thinking for the rest of his life. You see, Soros had a problem. He had amassed immense wealth for the firm, but something just wasn't right deep inside for him. He didn't have enough power, enough influence, and enough control to generate unseen amounts of money that he had truly desired. And deep down inside, he still felt weak and that feeling had to cease once and for all. And he had just the right idea to do it. You see, Soros had been building a huge short position in pound sterling for months leading up to the Black Wednesday of September 1992. He had noticed some significant problems and weaknesses within the UK's British pound. He thought the UK's currency, the British pound, was overvalued and its economy wasn't doing well. So he went all in and placed a $10 billion bet against the British pound predicting that the currency would collapse. And that's exactly what happened. So when the British pound went down, so did the UK government. They couldn't keep the value up, and many British people suffered horrendous financial losses, savings depletions, and economic hardship all at the hands of George Soros. But for Soros, this was the furthest thing from a tragedy. It was a sign from the gods that he was special and that he was different. And his huge profit of over $1 billion proved exactly that. This event caused a lot of chaos in the financial world and Soros earned himself the title, the man who broke the Bank of England. And that's when it hit him. Being at the center of crisis yielded immense profits and control like never before. If you knew how to exploit a crisis, you could be rich, you could be famous, you could control people's lives, and you could literally be God. And that is exactly what you would do. Let's say you're George Soros, and after you shorted the British pound, you discovered that taking advantage of crises was so extremely profitable and made you super powerful. You loved the feeling of control it gave you, it literally made you feel like God. But there was only one problem. It was hard finding crises, let alone ones that you could exploit. You needed a way to find crises and you needed a way to find them fast. If only there was an efficient way to start some on your own, you could basically have your own crisis money printer. But luckily for you, there was exactly a way to do that. Let me introduce you to a strategy called the Hegelian Dialectic. If you're going to orchestrate crisis and disorder, you first need to understand the process of actually manipulating public perception and behavior. And the Hegelian Dialectic shows you three steps to do it. Step one, create a problem. First, if you want a crisis, you need to create or instigate a problem that people desperately need solved. It needs to be vicious and people need to beg for it. So that way you could capitalize on it. This could be an orchestrated event like a market crash, a terrorist attack, or a sudden societal upheaval such as a riot or a health crisis. Whatever the nature of the problem is would ultimately fit the narrative of what you wanted to craft to fit your agenda. But what was most crucial was the chaos it created. Remember, the bigger the problem, the more desperate the public reaction will be. This desperation is what you will use to exploit people. Let's imagine you decide that society should drastically shift its views on foreign policy, embracing new values and beliefs, or that they should welcome new leaders in the world that they don't trust. You know that under normal circumstances, no one would agree to those ideas, so you either create or exploit a situation that endangers public security, a problem that's terrifying enough to shift public opinion. You'd force them into being aware that there was a problem that needed to be fixed. Which brings you to step two, the reaction. Your next step is to manage the public's reaction. This phase is crucial and requires controlling the narrative through media and silencing and censoring other media channels that exposed or don't agree with your agenda. Because remember, if your goal is to control people's minds and how they think, you want to amplify fear, uncertainty, and desperation. Because what better way to control people than with fear? 
You'd control every news cycle, every headline, and every thought in people's minds about this problem. It should paint a picture of chaos and hopelessness, funneling emotions and thoughts towards an overwhelming demand for a solution. Think of it like starting a fire. You need enough heat to make the public enraged and demand a solution. But your narrative should suggest that without drastic measures, their way of life, their way of safety, and their future are in imminent danger. They should feel vulnerable and in need of protection, protection that only you can provide. And you arrive at step three, the solution. Now you've set the stage to introduce the solution. This solution should seem like the only viable option to restore order and safety, effectively turning the public's fear into acceptance. But what you wouldn't tell the public is that this new solution to all their problems aligns perfectly with your original goal to assume more control, but the media will present you as the one to take the risk and the one who actually has a way to solve the problems within society. If your end goal was to change the way people live their lives, now you'd introduce that wonderful solution as the hero of the day, delivered in a way that the public was so relieved to be freed from the crisis that they don't even begin to ask questions about how it started or who would benefit from it later down the line. They should feel like they need it, not just accept it. Legislation, policies, or corporate practices that would have been rejected outright before the crisis are now welcomed with open arms. But you needed to remember, this would only work if the public was ignorant of your true motives and they couldn't point their fingers at you as the wolf in sheep's clothing. This strategy would allow you to act swiftly and decisively, capitalizing on the window of opportunity created by any crisis that you wanted. And that's exactly what you did. After learning this strategy, you went on a spree, creating crisis to crisis wherever you could, all while enriching yourself on the backs of others. You were on a roll and you couldn't be stopped. But although your campaign for control was a massive success in brainwashing the majority of people, not everyone would buy into your narrative, and they would even begin to see the truth behind your involvement. You see, as Soros went around the world economically terrorizing any country he could get his hands on, he quickly gained a bad reputation once people discovered he was behind destabilizing global currencies and markets around the world. He destabilized currencies in England, China, Thailand, Burma, Hungary, France, Russia, and so many other countries. Let me make this very clear. If you're George Soros, no country in the world is safe from you. You're considered a wanted criminal around the world in many countries, and in parts of the world you've been exposed and proven to use your wealth in the most evil ways possible, to orchestrate the destruction of nations and its people. You were an extremist who wanted open borders, a one world foreign policy, legalized drugs, euthanasia, and ultimately an idea of freedom that breaks down society through brainwashing. And America is the perfect victim for your sinister plot to make fortunes beyond your wildest dreams. Let's take an objective look at a crisis that you could use to further your agenda. The college riots. As it stands, there have been more than 2,100 people arrested at anti-Israel protests around the US. At Columbia, students set up tent encampments for protesters demanding universities to stop supporting and doing business with Israel or companies they found supporting the war against Gaza and Hamas. And it wasn't just happening at Columbia, it was happening at colleges all across the country. Naturally, this caused waves of division to sweep college campuses across the US, putting two large groups of students against each other. But if you're George Soros, this was a picture-perfect crisis for you to exploit, and you'd happily add gas to the fire. Remember how you donated 80% of all your net worth, making you the most generous giver? Well, what most people didn't know is that almost all of that money went to a charitable organization called the Open Society Foundation, in which you controlled. Since 2018 with this organization, you'd already invested around $700,000 in education in groups like For Just Peace in the Middle East and the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights. And these groups would be front and center protesting against the war in Gaza against the Palestinian people. But you had a trick up your sleeve. Instead of directly exposing yourself and giving blatant sums of money to the protesters, you'd hire individual people to go across numerous college campuses to instigate further conflicts. The USPCR provided up to $7,000 for its community-based fellows and between two dollars and $3,000 for its campus-based fellows in return for spending eight hours a week organizing campaigns led by by Palestinian organizations, and they were specifically trained to rise up to revolution. So now when your societal pawns go onto college campuses, instigate violence, and escalate conflict, it gives you the ultimate setup for the perfect solution. And your way to solve it was with more control. Israel supporters and even the president ran to the media's headlines to use these protests to denounce the violence. 
these peaceful protests were quickly turned into chaotic acts of violence and that's exactly what you wanted. You could now fool the public into believing that anti-Semitism, hate speech, discrimination, and outright destruction were the only thing that these protests would ultimately produce. So now, the issue was even bigger than that which was happening on college campuses. Now the whole country was divided, and the government would be required to step in and intervene. But this wouldn't be a problem at all, because you had a large group of politicians on your payroll who try to pass whatever law you saw fit. But if you wanted to have more control than ever before, what rights could you target? You couldn't just target any freedom, it would need to be an important one, and it needs to enable you to essentially destroy the one facet of this country that made it unique and special to begin with. And you knew just the right freedom to take from the citizens that would make them completely powerless. Freedom of speech. Since the country was just begging for a solution to this problem that you had created, you'd give them exactly what they asked for. The Anti-Semitism Bill. A bill focused on combating anti-Semitism as pro-Palestinian protests roll across colleges in the US. The bill, titled the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, would mandate that the Education Department adopt the broad definition of anti-Semitism used by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. And the alliance defines anti-Semitism as a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. Using this definition, almost anything can be declared anti-Semitism and that's exactly how you planned it. Now things were easy. If someone said something negative about you, there was a simple solution. They're anti-Semitic, let's shut them down. They said anything that exposed your plan to the world, let's censor them because no one should be spreading anti-Semitic and hateful ideas. You could do whatever you want, like send the college students to Gaza, and you could even try to ban the Bible. But what you had really accomplished was the ability to control the spread of ideas, thoughts, and crushed any way for people to speak up against injustice under the guise of anti-Semitism. And it was only a matter of time before the American people would no longer put up with your dystopian rulemaking and control of their lives. They would resort to chaos and destruction of their own country to take back their country from you and attempt to rebuild it as their own once again. But just like all those other currencies and countries across the world, the US dollar would be no different, and destroying this nation would be your biggest accomplishment in history. All while making you billions of dollars and making the American Eagle just another trophy on your wall. Thank you for watching The Dark Side of Dollars. Check out our other videos and remember, the truth lies in the details.